Good evening. Welcome to tonight's panel on recognizing the legacy of slavery in Rhode Island and to our year-long series on memorials and commemoration in the U.S. Tonight's program will start with a short video about the humanities at URI. We are facing problems and challenges that do not have easy, simple, finite solutions. Machines are going to be doing so much stuff for us. The only things that are going to be left are the things that only human brains can do. And those kinds of things are taught by the arts and humanities. Studying the humanities, studying literature, drama, art, performance, what that feeds in a student is possibility. The University of Rhode Island is a really good place to pursue one's interests in an environment of opportunities. That engagement, in some way, shape, or form, becomes in part the definition of the university experience. Every area of the humanities trains you to investigate, explore. If you want to lead, you have to have a broad, interdisciplinary, open-minded approach to the world. Exploration is the foundation of everything that we do. You have to be able to think beyond the circumstances you're presently in. The critical thinking, the language skills, reasoning abilities, those are the ways that you can build a bridge between what you did before and what you can do in the future. The skills students learn in the humanities are skills that they will take into every aspect of their future life both personal and professional. The problems that we have facing us are complicated issues that require people who move across disciplines, think creatively, think deeply. That's something that humanities provides. You're getting that methodology and the practice um, that'll prepare you for your future. Good evening. I'm Eve Stern, Director of URI Center for the Humanities. I'd like to welcome you to the fifth event in our year-long series on memorials and commemoration in the U.S. This year-long series of virtual and in-person events discusses our collective decisions and dialogue about what to commemorate, the ideals we express, and whom we include. This evening, the Center is delighted to host a panel on recognizing the legacy of slavery in Rhode Island. Our panel will feature, in this order, Victoria Johnson, Charles Roberts, and James DeWolf Perry. Our speakers represent three local organizations doing important work to recognize and spread awareness of the complicated legacy of slavery in the ocean state. We will have questions and answers after the talk, so please type your questions into the chat at any time during the presentation. Now I'm delighted to welcome tonight's moderator, Dr. Joanne Pope Mellish. Dr. Mellish is Emeritus Associate Professor of History at the University of Kentucky and author of the important and well-known book, Disowning Slavery, Gradual Emancipation and Race in New England, 1780 to 1860. Joanne will introduce each panelist before they speak and then moderate the discussion. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to introduce Victoria Johnson. Victoria is a member of the founding committee and steering committee for the Newport Middle Passage Ceremony and Port Marker Project. Um, she is a native of Newport. She had a distinguished career in teaching, coaching, educational administration that included becoming the first female African-American principal of a secondary school in Rhode Island. She is active in the Newport Historical Society on the governor's board for the bank, um, for the Bank of Newport. Newport Women's League, National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, Newport Hospital Board of Directors, Newport Rec Reunion Committee, 
and Newport County NAACP. She participates on many scholarship committees with the Rhode Island Foundation so that worthy and qualified students may have financial aid to attend college. Welcome, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you, Mrs. Malish, and thank all of you for inviting me to tell you a little bit about the birth of the Middle Passage. New Port Middle Passage project began in 2016 with a telephone call. I was on vacation and my cell phone rang. A number I was not familiar with popped up on the screen. I don't usually answer unknown numbers, but something said, get this one. The speaker was a man from Brown University. His name was Peter Fay, and he had just come from a meeting with an assistant professor from Howard University. She was representing a woman named Ann Chin, who was establishing a national project to raise awareness of the role that Middle Passage played in the United States. Providence, Bristol, Warren, and Newport. Those were the four ports where ships came to Rhode Island and eventually dominated the American slave trade. He asked if I would attend the next session representing Newport. I went, because I was curious. I didn't feel I knew enough about the Middle Passage or the triangular trade, and I wanted to know more. It was at that session when it was reported to me that there were people who attended the first meeting and wanted to know what the value of this project was by placing markers in a port to commemorate the arrival of slaves to the state of Rhode Island. And my mind went wild and I grasped this thought. I thought, how can we not honor those thousands of Africans who were free in their homeland, forcefully captured and brought to Rhode Island through the triangular trade via, via the Middle Passage? In Newport, the making of rum in about 22 distilleries was put on ships, traded on the West African coast for captured people who were then taken to the West Indies to be sold and to work in the sugar and rice plantations. And with the profits, molasses was purchased and transferred back to Newport. And the triangle was repeated over and over again. At that moment, in just a few seconds, all of which I talked about went through my mind. And I guess I did know enough about the Middle Passage. And I knew I had to be part of this project. The National Project has recently verified 52 ports where Africans were sent to work and labor. Slaves did not enter America through Ellis Island. Slaves came to the America in slave ships, and many of them through the Middle Passage. They were Africans. The next generation, believe it or not, was defined as African Americans. And then for some reason, my generation, fourth or fifth generation, I think, were defined as colored, Negro, Black, Afro-American, and now coming full circle, again, we're being described as African-American. All of it discriminated by the N-word. There are times when those who purchase or perished in the Middle Passage and those who survived, barely survived, and lived in American bondage, those who escaped and those who were saved through the Underground Railroad. But most importantly for me, those who became African American first in the city of Newport. Yet there is very little narrative that tells us about the heritage of African American people who made valuable and so many valuable economic and cultural contributions to our city. How can our lives have been so unconsciously forgotten or willfully suppressed? How does one 
acclaim memories lost and never acknowledged? How does one unerase the lives and heritage of those forgotten, whether they be Native American, African, Irish, Italian, Germany, or any nationality, any ethnic race or religion? Our heritage is our country. But for most of us, our birthplace is America, land of the proud and the free. Take a look at the public spaces in Newport, the institutional cultures where we have monuments, historic buildings, parks, and other sites that tell the public and the tourists the narrative of the 17th through the 20th century. Yet we have no memorials to acknowledge the contributions of Africans and African Americans in the city of Newport. Middle Passage Memorial will begin to tell an untold rest of the story for the Africans and their American descendants who were born in Newport or came later to live here. The African and African American value can truly be accomplished through our Mid Newport Middle Passage Port Marker Project, a memorial activity communicating, commemorating the story of Newport's enslaved and freed res residents not yet told in full. We can continue to recant God's Little Acre legends from the colonial area. And through the Rhode Island Slave History Medallions, we can project and capture additional valuable information about the residents of our heritage. We are beginning to unearth stories in history that have been buried or allowed to be forgotten. Yes, Newport has several stories to tell. We have stories of the carpenters and the masons, the sailors, the painters, the pastry cooks. I know most people know about Duchess Cuomo. The musician and teachers like Newport Gardner, the sachems like Quinnipin. And then there's Isaac Rice, an abolitionist, or Reverend Van Horn, a Rhode Island legislator for three terms. The Proceedings of the Free African Union Society and the African Benevolent Society is an amazing written legacy of two groups established in 1780. In the minutes of these two groups was edited in 1976 by Dr. William H. Robinson, past director of Black Studies at the University of Rhode Island. The Newport Historical Society has an original copy that has now been digitalized it is more than a story. It is a publication that Africans and African Americans in the city of Newport broadened and deepened our understanding of free Africans in Newport. The Middle Passage will enhance and increase the value of all African and African Americans who arrived to live in Newport for the past 383 years. It will embody our presence and value of our contributions. I am pleased to report that Warren has already completed a commemorative honoring the Middle Passage. And Bristol is also in the process of preparing plans to their city council in an appeal to plan a tribute honoring those slaves brought and sold in the city of Bristol. There is so much that this Newport Memorial can reveal to the world that will tell the impact made by black people in the making of America. We have to teach the honest truth for a better future. It should be about equity in the representation of all people for black, brown and yellow people. This memorial will glow with realism and be the first structure built to remember and honor African-American historical heritage in the city of Newport. And I wish to thank you so very much for allowing me to tell you the Middle Passage story and recognizing the legacy of slavery in Rhode Island. Thank you.
very much, Mrs. Johnson. Uh, let me now introduce Charles Roberts. Uh, Charles Roberts is the founder and executive director of Rhode Island Slave History Medallions, uh, a nonprofit um, place-based statewide education program recognized by the Rhode Island General Assembly. Mr. Roberts is a native Rhode Islander whose family has lived in Newport since 19, uh, 1889. A visual artist, he studied graphic design at the Rhode Island School of Design and has exhibited his work at the Spring Bull Gallery, Newport Art Museum, Du Bois Gallery, Hope Street Gallery, all in Rhode Island, as well as places, uh, the New Jersey State House. He also worked in concert production and promotion with Warner Atlantic Electra Records in New York in which capacity he worked with James Brown, Chaka Khan, Gladys Knight, Run DMC, and other artists. Mr. Roberts also has organized gospel concerts in Rhode Island at the Veterans Memorial Hall and Providence Performing Arts Center while managing and producing the popular First Night Newport, a citywide New Year's Eve celebration of the arts for nearly a decade. Welcome, Mr. Roberts. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, most of it is about my past life as a, uh, a producer and promoter in New York uh, in the music business. But thank God for that experience because it's given me the opportunity to promote uh, the history of Rhode Island uh, slavery uh, in, in this community that I was born in. So uh, as I've been told, I'm Charles Roberts, the founder of, of uh, Rhode Island Slave History. And we were uh, founded in 2017. In fact, I had worked with uh, Mrs. Johnson at the Slave History at her project. And, and this became an offshoot of it uh, uh, because I saw a need to go even further to, to uh, make sure that the, the people of the state realized their uh, their opportunity to to examine the history and the economic development of the state through their free labor of uh, enslaved Africans and indigenous people, and be able to uh, contribute, show the con contribution of their lives that this uh, to the state uh, and the unvarnished history and truth, uh, so that hopefully uh, these stories would inspire racial healing. Uh, as uh, as uh, 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 Joanne has stated, uh, we've been uh, recognized uh, by the Rhode Island State Council uh, uh, General Assembly as a statewide education program. With our medallions, we try to shed light on the historic role of the enslaved uh, Africans and uh, indigenous Americans. And what we do is with each of our, our medallions, which are images that were created by Pompey Stevens, and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Each of the medallions carries a QR code technology that when scanned with your phone connects the viewer to your digital archives of documented content uh, that as a low, at that location, and we plan to install medallions in 25 cities and towns and uh, tell the story of enslaved people. Now, uh, marking this landscape is a very unique process because uh, as I've experienced in Africa and here, you're standing in the very place where your ancestors at one time experience their lives uh, back in, in the day. You're, I call it being uh, standing on holy ground. So far, uh, we've uh, installed these medallions in, in right now in six cities. The first one we started with was at Bowen's Wharf, where we uh, explained the role of the enslaved workers in maritime history. I mean, it was, imagine being kidnapped from your country 
brought across the waters, made to work on the docks where you were enslaved, building ships and ropes and and uh, uh, barrels to keep the rum in, and then being put on the ship after growing up and becoming a sailor and sailing back to Africa where you took barrels of rum and traded it to enslave your own people. Imagine the horror that was felt when you realized what you were doing and you had no choice because you were a slave. So the next location we uh, placed medallions was at Patriots Park, where enslaved Indian and indigenous military uh, provided military service at the Battle of Rhode Island, the first battle where an integrated army of blacks and indigenous people and and white uh, uh, slave uh, farm boys could had to fight against an army of Hessians that were mercenaries, crack troops, and yet they held them and pushed them back and saved, got a chance to save the rest of the army, our army, so we could escape to fight again another day. This is a very special location for me because uh, uh, it's a, some, a place that I was raised to learn about at a very young age back in the 50s, that we actually had a history and contributed to, the, to America. The second place we placed medallions at, at Smith's Castle, where that was the land of uh, Roger Williams, where he, where he, where he first had his uh, uh, store. And, and, and there, that was where generations of enslaved workers had died and been buried. We found their remains there. The next location we placed a medallion was at the uh, 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 East Ferry Wharf in Jamestown. And that's where Native American uh, culture and economics contributed to enslavement and the stories. These are stories of the enslaved. Remember before they enslaved Africans, they enslave the indigenous people. Then we moved another uh, to Linden Place, where, uh, where the stories of the massive e uh, economic gain that from the transatlantic slave trade were told by the stories of the uh, infamous DeWolf family. We also made a land acknowledgement there for the indigenous people, the Wampanoag, that was very special because it took place during the time that uh, that that uh, uh, we were fortunate enough to have the first time that boy that uh, uh, it was just something that uh, yeah it, amazing to me because of what I felt there. I mean, we had to move. That was Juneteenth the first time that we had celebrated Juneteenth as a national holiday. And we moved then to DeWolf Tavern where descendants of the enslaved DeWolf family got together and we, we did a healing ceremony for those that had been enslaved and for the, not just the black enslaved, but the enslavers so that they could get an opportunity to share in this experience. It was an act of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to place a medallions at Channing Church. In fact, we just did that for Black History Month, where we told the story of Duchess Camino and William Ellery Channing. It's a very amazing story because you get a chance to see what was taking place the difference between being enslaved and being the enslaver, and even though you were in a benevolent enslaver, the difference in the lives that was shared. Next, we're gonna to go to Rocky Hill School, where, where we're going to put a medallion uh, in, in, at the place that Colonel Christopher Green, the man that 
formed the black regiment uh, lived and he was killed. Uh, it, and we feel that because he was the man that formed the black regiment that be able to stand against the British at the first battle of Rhode Island. Then we're gonna go to Casey Farm in South County where uh, Native Americans and Africans were enslaved and helped to grow the, prop the, 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 the food that was sent to the islands for this massive, massive group of enslaved people so that they could be able to keep this machine, this institution rolling. And finally, we're going to go up to uh, Sayreville's meeting house in Lincoln in September, where we're going to tell the st interesting story of the Quakers, who were some of the first people to be involved in slavery. And then through their the awakening and, and an understanding of humanity, they became uh, uh, abolitionists and fought against slavery. One of them was... Uh, a, part of the Brown family, Moses Brown. And it's just a, an interesting, exciting story to see the paradigm that took place because of uh, the issue of slavery. Finally, what we plan on doing is using this, uh, uh, the, making a map of uh, historical tourism and cultural diversity, an act of remembrance so that people uh, who come here uh, to understand uh, the history of medallions and the history of black uh, of of Rhode Island can see that history for themselves and travel around the state to understand and recognize uh, the cultural uh, and uh, cultural contributions of BIPAC people. And I thank you for listening to me in my rather emotional way approach, but. Uh, this story is a part of me. It's a part of my in ancestries. I lived in Africa. So I bring those feelings of being part of the motherland with me when I discuss Rhode Island slave history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Now um, I will introduce um, James DeWolf Perry. Um, James serves on the board of directors of the Center for Reconciliation in Providence. He was nominated for an Emmy Award as the principal historical consultant for the PBS documentary, Traces of the Trade, a story from the deep north about the legacy of the slave trade in New England. He also appears throughout the film um, because he's a descendant of James DeWolf, the most prolific slave trader in US history. Mr. Perry uh, co-founded the Tracing Center on Histories and Legacies of Slavery. And while it's, uh, he was its executive director, he designed and led many of the center's public programs on racial healing and equity, as well as professional workshops in education and public history. He edited Interpreting Slavery at Museums and Historic Sites, which came out in 2015 and his other published work addresses the teaching and interpretation of slavery and its legacy. Welcome, James. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. I'm delighted to be with you all tonight representing the Center for Reconciliation. Um, the Center for Reconciliation, or the CFR, is an organization that's affiliated with the Episcopal Diocese of Rhode Island. That is the collection of Episcopal churches in the state of Rhode Island headed by the Episcopal Bishop of Rhode Island, Nicholas Nisley. And our mission is to foster racial justice and reconciliation by confronting the legacy of slavery. So this panel is very much squarely on point in terms of the mission that we try to carry out. The origins of the Center for Reconciliation go back to 2007. Uh, at that time, several of us in the DeWolf family were wrapping up filming on Traces of the Trade, the PBS documentary that Joanne mentioned. Um, this, I imagine some of you have seen this, for those of you who have not, um, Traces of the Trade takes 10 of us who are descendants of the DeWolf family 200 years later 
and shows the viewers us going across the triangle trade, learning from historians, including Joanne Mellish, uh, what our family had done, the extent of our family's slave trading. And the viewer gets to see us wrestling with what that history means for us as DeWolf descendants today, what we make of the legacy of that history today, and how we respond to that as DeWolf descendants, as Americans today. And in 2007, we were filming the final scene of the documentary. It was at St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Bristol. And at the end of the scene, uh, the priest at that time, David Dobbins, and his deacon, Jan Grinnell, uh, invited everyone in the congregation up. It was DeWolf family members, it was uh, Bristol residents more broadly, and invited us to come up for a brief laying on of hands, a symbolic act of acknowledgement and atonement for the DeWolf family and Bristol's involvement in the slave trade. That moment made a large impression on all of us and particularly on David and Jan. And several years later, that was going to become relevant. Um, after a few years, it became necessary for the Episcopal Diocese to reconsider what to do with uh, the Episcopal Cathedral in Providence. It's a big, beautiful old church building on North Main Street, and uh, it was in disrepair. Uh, the congregation alone couldn't handle uh, maintaining the property, and so the diocese was casting about for what maybe to do, what creative ideas could be come up with for uh, an Episcopal Cathedral in the 21st century. And David and Jan uh, remembered their belief back in 2007 in doing something about having learned about this history. And so they got together with a number of other uh, Episcopal Church members in Rhode Island. And really the idea that was exciting in the diocese to proceed with was to create this kind of a center for racial reconciliation and healing to be located this was the original vision to be located in the Episcopal Cathedral, uh, to use that as a community base for reaching out to the state of Rhode Island, uh, as well as within the Episcopal Church. Um, so by 2015, we had founded the Center for Reconciliation. And uh, our vision is to educate the public about the history of slavery and race in Rhode Island, as well as related difficult issues of history. Um, not just to raise awareness of this history and the lessons that the history holds for us today, but to try to help the public become aware of the legacy of this history and help jumpstart conversations about how we can heal today and about how advocacy can be engaged in for racial justice based on our knowledge of the past. Um, and really as a starting point, and this has always been striking to me, as a starting point, uh, the Center for Reconciliation takes the Episcopal Church's own history of complicity in slavery and racism, both in Rhode Island and in the broader Episcopal Church in the United States. So we come to the table acknowledging in a very candid way the ways in which we as a church have benefited from this history in order to help all Rhode Islanders uh, feel comfortable acknowledging the ways in which they and their families may have been connected to this history as well either because they were present at the time and somehow complicit in this history, or simply because of the ways in which we've all, as Rhode Islanders, inherited this history. To that end, we've had a variety of programming uh, in the seven years since we were founded. We've offered educational programs at uh, churches and other venues across the state, as well as uh, our own programming at the cathedral and elsewhere for the general public. We talk about the details of the history of slavery and race and inequality. Um, we talk about that legacy today. We foster those kinds of conversations. We try to encourage white people to sit down and talk about this history because for many white people it's the first time they've actually come to terms with the full scope of this history or had a chance to talk about it personally um, as well as conversations across racial lines and in multiracial groups to try to begin to wrestle with how to work on this history collectively together and how we can move forward we've had uh, historical exhibitions in the basement of the cathedral in a big beautiful uh, old parish hall space as well as a traveling exhibition that's gone around the state of Rhode Island um, we have for years now had slavery walking tours in Providence to help uncover some of the uh, the slavery uh, history in Providence itself. Um, we've offered trainings for museum staff in Rhode Island and elsewhere uh, in how to interpret this kind of difficult history. Uh, 
We've engaged in a variety of partnerships to try to support the many other organizations in Rhode Island that have been at the forefront of trying to address this history and trying to address racial justice today. Um, and we've tried to engage in our own forms of advocacy. So for example, the truth and reconciliation process that the city of Providence has undergone. Um, when they came up with a report and had findings on that history uh, last year, uh, the press conference was held in our space at the cathedral. Um, and uh, in recent days, uh, a reparations commission, as many of you know, has been formed by the city of Providence to begin looking at the question of reparations for this history. Um, and the Center for Reconciliation as part of the Episcopal Church in Rhode Island uh, has been very much interested in trying to endorse that process to explore reparations. We're not interested in being the ones to try to have a voice in what form reparations might take, but we want to help with that conversation on the need for reparations, where that need comes from, uh, and how that can be one part of a process of racial justice and racial healing. During the pandemic, uh, we've had to be a little bit more limited in our activities. Uh, so we've engaged in a number of Zoom webinars. Uh, we've recently resumed our slavery walking tours. Uh, we're in the process of training a group of people who can go out and lead discussion groups in various parts of the state now that the pandemic is entering a new phase. Um, and as I say, we've been very supportive of the Reparations Commission in that process in Providence. Um, we've recently reorganized after a number of uh, false starts and useful initial steps um, from which we've learned. Um, we have recently reorganized to be fully a mission, a ministry of the Episcopal Diocese in Rhode Island. Um, we're looking forward in the coming year to engaging in far more in the way of book groups and discussion groups, um, to offering anti-racism work in churches and uh, church affiliated schools. Um, in all of this, we try to take uh, an explicitly Christian perspective, not that we're limited to people who are Christian by any means, and we're certainly not limited to the uh, Episcopal perspective, but from a non-denominational Christian perspective, we try to use the language of religion, the perspective of religion, um, to try advance conversations in a way that can sometimes be hard in a more secular context. Um, Depending on what kind of questions come up in the rest uh, of this session, I would certainly be happy to talk about some of the missteps that I alluded to before. Um, there's no question that we've um, we've learned a lot in doing our work. Uh, it's been sometimes hard to get a number of the people who've been very supportive, very passionate of the idea of an organization like this, uh, interested in seriously doing their homework. The Episcopal Church in Rhode Island is a heavily white institution. And as such, there are a lot of white people who are very supportive of this endeavor, interested in volunteering, for example, um, but who often think that they're ready to jump into doing this work without necessarily doing the hard work uh, of coming to understand as white people what this history has been and what the reality of race is today. So for us, doing things like embracing critical race theory uh, as one framework for starting to understand the present is very important. Um, let me leave it at that, and I'm very interested in uh, in what kind of questions you all have. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, encouraging the audience to, uh, to put questions in the chat, um, and um, we're now going to start the conversation. There are already some questions in the chat, so I think I will ask one of those, um, which is something that I, I would have asked as my first question as well. Why is there this yawning gap in our knowledge about enslaved Africans brought to Rhode Island? Why, um, how is it that so many people are unaware of it? Who would like to answer that? I would. Okay. <laughs> I think I would. I think I would like to start with that question, because you have to remember, even during my age coming up into my teenage years and into even into my college, we were still segregating. We segregated ourselves. I know many times that when I would go down and try to find a job at Thames Street and couldn't find one. But thank God for the London Pipe Shop. They hired me. The wisest hired me and taught me how to use the cash register and how to um, look at the supplies and how to order them. And with that information that they gave me, um, I felt like 
I'm not segregated anymore. I can do when I want what I please. And then when the city of Newport hired me as a playground teacher, I was a playground teacher for five years. And I had not only black children, African children, or Negro children, as they colored children, as they were called then. I also had white stu- white kids in my in my playground, and we went everywhere together. So I think the main reason is is because we segregated each other, and we slowly have come out of that. Charles. Yes. Well, I would I would say that also. Uh, this history has been hidden uh, systematically on purpose. Mm. I mean, so that the uh, masters, and I just say it like this, why? If I'm in charge and I'm the master of a whole race of people that I have working for me for free, so that I don't even have to handle my own uh, uh, pot to pee in, would I give them freedom over uh, instead over me and be equal to me when I'm gaining so much economic development uh, that that they could never catch up to me economically? So therefore, they would always be enslaved. And I think that that's part of the reason. This is called an, the institution of slavery and the institution of racism, and it was created. Uh, on purpose for economic reasons. Okay. Would would I, someone else, James? Sure. I would. I agree very much with all of that. And I would just add that you know I think, um, particularly by the time of the Civil War, yeah. when New England was starting to you know had been for years trying to think of itself as an abolitionist place and forget its slavery background. Um, you know, at the time of the Civil War, uh, we throughout the war increasingly came to define the moral cause of the Civil War for the North as eradicating slavery in the South. And that necessarily meant forgetting that New England had been actively involved in slavery, that there were enslaved Africans here, that we had done a tremendous amount of slave trading. Um, and so it was, as Charles says, partly a very deliberate process and partly a process of not talking about it anymore. There wasn't as much evidence uh, in the landscape that there had been enslaved people here and that there had been slave trafficking here as in the South. Um, and after a while that becomes an integral part of how New Englanders understand their past, that we were not wrapped up in Southern slavery. Um, and that's the point at which I think people start engaging in cognitive bias and ignoring bits of evidence as they come across it in school textbooks or elsewhere, in gravestones and cemeteries, uh, that there had been quite a bit of slavery once upon a time. I, I would like to just quickly throw in the fact that, um, that, that kids are never taught that the majority of immigrants to this country before the revolution were unfree. A large chunk of them were African, a large chunk of them were unfree white servants and so, so forth. But the idea that this land of so-called freedom was a land that was um, initially populated by unfree people is something that um, just is a piece of the suppressed history, I would argue. Um, let me see here. What do we, what else? Um, I'm looking in the chat and um, I'm seeing uh Joanne, there is a question on the bottom of the screen. Oh, okay, there wasn't on my screen for a long time, and I was I was looking for it over to the right. Um, are there plans to incorporate this important narrative of African American and Indigenous contributions into the K through twelve state curriculum? This any. Yes. Yes, I was very fortunate to attend a ceremony where um, the governor signed a resolution stating that there was to be a curriculum that's going to be created 
and placed into the curriculum in all of the schools in the state of Rhode Island. It was fabulous. I mean, people were crying and <laughs> it was just, it's like, finally, it's going to happen. We're going to learn the complete history of what's occurring and what's happening, of what did happen in the state of Rhode Island, as far as African Americans, um, as you're saying, Irish Irish servants that came here, those that, and, and you're right, Joanne, those that were not processed that came through, the um, didn't come through Ellis Island and ca didn't and came through the ships. So to be able for us to give that history to our students is probably one of the most wonderful things that ever happened in the education in the state of Rhode Island. I will say quickly that something like 10 years ago, there was a, a move to put, to get slavery into the history of the curriculum and it went precisely nowhere. Yeah, it's uh, on its way now, for hopefully. So now it's on its way, and that's great. Charles? Yes, uh, I, I hope it's on its way. If, if they put money behind it, that makes it on its way. Uh, but uh, I, I, I know that for us, uh, we've created educational programs. That's what slave history medallions are. That's why and for young people, and I mean 12-year-olds have phones with uh, QR codes in them, and they can scan the information and hear it for them and see it for themselves. But we also, uh, in consideration for a younger audience, we make sure that we do educational programs for uh, BIPOC people. One of them was the, we brought uh, uh, kids from the neighborhood, uh, African-American uh, kids from the neighborhood to see the movie Harriet. And they were inspired by the movie, but yeah. their, their, their comments to us were surprising. I mean, first of all, they didn't even know there was such a thing as an abolitionist, never mind a black one. And second of all, they were really surprised because that was the first time they ever got a chance to come downtown in Newport to a, a theater and see a, a movie with black people in it. Yeah. You know, and this was just two years ago. So there's a lot of the, uh, the, then we've done uh, uh, projects for young people at Patriots Park where their families and the young people, I'm talking about 12s and 12 year olds, were, uh, were allowed to see and in the reenactments of their history right in front of them so that they could experience it and have drum ceremonies and see cannons being fired and hear their history so that it becomes an act of remembrance, a part of their lives, rather than just something that's stagnant in a school room or a school book that uh, doesn't, doesn't become a part of their cellular memory. I would argue that a classroom doesn't have to be stagnant. <laughs> As someone who taught for many, many years, um, is, is there another uh, um, question? question that goes below the screen that I can see. It's much harder for me to, um, ah, okay. Will there be plans for a walking trail too? Or is the plan to create a monument or memorial? Oh, I get, wait, right now, uh, the, the whole idea of medallions, I mean, we've started in, in Newport, but we've spread all the way to Blackstone Valley, We've spread all the way to uh, 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 South Kingstown, and it is a trail. We, uh, we've had people that, that have called us and want to know where the medallions are because they actually get there in their cars and travel to all of the locations where there is a medallion to get the information. But in Newport, we we're fortunate enough to have in the uh, historic district our first medallion placed at the Channing House, and hopefully next there's going to be one at the Vernon House, so that people can come to Newport and with a walking tour, experience the different locations where slavery took place and the slave stories of the enslaver and the enslaved. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, more questions. Um, what kinds of efforts are underway to restore and repair 
uh, headstones that have been destroyed or damaged over time in historic African-American cemeteries in Rhode Island. Let me add something to that question for a minute because um, there are in there are edge stones that are barely visible in many cemeteries where enslaved people are buried and they're not um, they're not visibly headstones. So I'm curious to see restore and repair headstones, but what about restoring and repairing those, um, those, I don't even know what to call them, but the edge stones that mark the cemeteries of enslaved people. Does someone know about that? I might that? be able to speak just a little bit to the um, God's Little Acre um, cemetery, which um, has many, many headstones that, um, thanks to the work of um, a gentleman named Lou Keen, who has worked throughout the cemeteries in the city of Newport, and he has volunteers, and every spring they go into the cemeteries and clean them up and take away the, the rubbish and and, and mow, they help mow and take care of the brush, and he's done just a this job and making sure that our cemeteries are are there and that people, tourists can come in and see the cemeteries and see and see their ancestors their own ancestors that are in the cemeteries so i do give credit to lou for doing that so i can say in the city of newport that is definitely not true i haven't been to many cemeteries outside of newport with the exception of middletown I'd like to say the the uh, medallion itself is a recreation of the headstone of uh, Cuffy Gibbs. Pompey Stevens, who worked in the uh, Stevens shop, was a slave. And I, 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 when I feel the story, I feel and because I've walked through it and and was inspired by uh, uh, Pompey Stevens and the carvings that I saw, all these angel images. I mean, at one time I walked through there and I thought I was walking through a field of angels because of seeing all these carved medallion stories. And one of the stories is uh, is Pompey Stevens that he carved a his brother's gravestone in 1768. Now, we know that, uh, or I feel that that was an act of defiance because he was a slave, he wasn't even allowed to have a family. Families were not, you were part of the family of the slaves. If you were a man, you may have married a black woman, but your children didn't belong to you, they belonged to your master. And that's the type of uh, uh, the difference in this nostalgia of uh, showing that slavery might have been just servitude. No, it was, it was slavery. So. Pompey, you had no rights, nothing. So imagine Pompey Stevens, he goes to William Stevens, and he's been carving these stones, hundreds of them, and says to him, well, look, uh, I'll carve hundreds of more slave stones for you. But this one is of my brother, Cuffy Gibbs, even though he doesn't have my name. And I'm going to sign it to let everybody know that that's my brother. And then by signing it, he let our, our, uh, everyone know all the way down into history that these that Africans were making the, 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 the slave stones, the furniture, and that was actually being sold uh, by their colonial masters. So that's the significance of really uh, a signed gravestone at uh, God's Little Acre. And I'm proud to have recognized it and be able to share that image, that soul effigy, where during the Enlightenment, all peoples, uh, religions believe that when you died, your soul was carried on the wings of angels. And that's a carved medallion, medallion gravestone. It's carved for a slave by a slave. I, I would just like to to not contradict you so much as to add to 
um, I would like to see some effort made to identify or at least point out the presence of edge stones that have no carving on them around the the exteriors of or not exteriors around the the perimeters of cemeteries full of white people that are the places where their enslaved servants are buried because i think that's important too not that the medallions are not important but i think they're very important but i think um if if we're going to impress upon the people of rhode island the the significance of the the sheer presence of enslaved africans um, part of the way to do that is to call attention to the places in which they are buried on the per, on the perimeters of of cemeteries. Um, now, let's see. I I agree with you, Joanne. You're very intuitive on that point. I think no matter where the cemetery is, because our ancestors. That's one of the ways that we need to continue with all heritages through the cemeteries. So I, I think that's extremely important. Okay. Um, now, um, how is this conversation uh, benefited um, via the lens of religion versus a secular approach? Um, how does, how does, Thinking about these matters from a religious perspective, um, compare, contrast, elevate, not elevate these discussions done in a secular sort of way. I hate to keep talking, but you know, one of the ways that uh, I've seen it, uh, I, I work with the Channing Church a lot, and because of their uh, their approach to religions as, as principles. And one of the principles is that we are all one people under one uh, uh, spiritual uh, God, a source. But another way that I've seen this approach is through the recognition that I, I wish I shared with the DeWolf family when they did the, uh, the healing ceremony. Because at that, by in those ceremonies, they recognize not just the uh, emotional impact of slavery on black people, but the emotional impact on slavery on white people. And we've got a chance to address that issue as human beings, as a people trying to right what is a wrong, was a wrong. And uh, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to meet James in 2007 before I even realized the impact of what he was doing with the Traces of a Trade movie. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to address that as an approach spiritually. James, do you have something maybe you wanna to add to that? Sure, I've, uh, I've had the privilege of heading up uh, nonprofit organizations from both a secular and from a faith-based uh, perspective, and they're different, and they both have strengths and advantages. Um, obviously, a secular perspective uh, can incorporate more people more easily without fear of seeming to exclude, um, and can incorporate a greater variety of perspectives, but faith-based organizations bring a lot to the table, and talking to people as people of faith, uh, whether that Christian, Jewish, a different faith um, offers a great deal. And more than anything else, I think, um, you know, it's great to be able to quote scripture and talk to people about, um, you know, the imperative of their faith to bring people closer together, to fight for justice and so forth. Um, but more than anything else, you know, we get white people in this country very often saying, I've got nothing to do with this. Um, they say, my family didn't have anything to do with it, or if it did, and I know people whose families were deeply involved in the slave trade, for example, who reject anything to do with that because it wasn't in their own lifetimes, because they didn't do it personally. From a Christian perspective, uh, we can speak as people who have a larger existence, part of a church that stretches back 2,000 years. If our church, our denomination, did things in complicity, uh, we then have an obligation to make that right, to be able to speak in those much broader terms and about 
a responsibility to everyone uh, to bring us closer together. Um, that kind of reconciliation. It's a powerful language, and there are a lot of people who don't see the need as white people, as citizens of the United States, for example, to do anything about this. But when you talk to them about their Christian faith, they understand that it's much broader than that. It's also, it seems to me, an accountability issue. I mean, there are uh, churches, there's one in Connecticut that proudly bought a small enslaved African boy as a present for their minister when he completed 20 years of service to the church. It seems to me that um, it, having some sort of accountability for that kind of action and thinking is, is important. Yes, I mean. You know. Yes, and, and people respond to that, right? If you talk about slave galleries in churches, if you talk about how many ministers in colonial times were given an enslaved person by their congregation, um, that matters. When you talk in the Episcopal Church um, about senior members of the church having given passionate sermons or written pamphlets uh, supporting slavery, even if they were Northerners, um, people sit up and take notice and consider themselves part of that ongoing tradition, and we need to fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, fortunately, we do have a, a like Trinity Church and about the uh, uh, people at St. John's in, in Newport who are recognizing that truth, accepting mm -hmm. it, and uh, as a symbol, put a medallion there so that everyone can walk by with their phones and get a chance to learn about it and see that they've done, it might be looked at as a small thing, but it's actually a huge thing that where they've accepted their part in this institution and have made an effort to do something about it. Uh, when you look at all the churches that could do this, imagine the critical mass of people you would have accepting reconciliation. Is there another question? Uh, okay, what about all the Rhode Island mill owners ah, and their descendants? This is a particularly interesting point of view to me the mill owners and their descendants who profited from the labor of enslaved people. Can, uh, can you speak to that? Let me just quickly speak to that myself. And that is that uh, we have um, Moses Brown supporting Slater Mill and Samuel Slater, um, which supporting uh, the birth of the industrial revolution around the uh, the processing of slave-grown cotton. And it certainly is the case that there are a lot of New Englanders and a lot of Rhode Islanders who wa didn't want slavery here, but we they were fine with enslaved people somewhere else providing material that supported their profit. Um, so I, I get worked up about that. Um, is, would one of you like to speak to that? I mean, we're putting a medallion. We're dealing with Moses Brown and his Quakerism and, and his family at uh, the uh, Quaker Meeting House in Sayreville. And we're also working with uh, in Blackstone Valley with the, the, the Slater Mill. And I must say, uh, when you talk about the Industrial Revolution, when you talk about uh, the North's involvement in the slave trade, all you have to do is say one word, slave cloth. Yeah. Because we all the, the clothes that were made for slaves were made here and shipped down there. When you talk about slave cloth, you talk about uh, the, uh, the movement of Indians off their land. So that could be a second uh, enslavement of, of peoples. So because cotton was king. It was shipped to Britain and all across the world. So right. even with the, uh, and I learned this through Joanne, thank you, uh, uh, that that the enslavement of uh, uh, African Americans and the and then the uh, through the Industrial Revolution uh, that at that time was an important. I mean, uh, it just important to the economic development. One more time. We're talking about global economics, of, yeah. but through the exploitation of the other, meaning 
anyone of color. That's true. Um, do we have another question? Um, so many people in Rhode Island live in non-integrated communities and have no friends or neighbors of different races. How do they begin to integrate their experiences so that this matters personally to them? That's a complicated question. Who would like to talk about that? Wow. James? Um, I, could, I could say one or two things. I mean, first of all, we could actually try integrating our communities. Um, we have made so little progress on addressing residential segregation in this country. Um, it's, it's really disappointing. Um, but at the Center for Reconciliation, one of the things that really interests us is the fact that, um, you know, churches in this country tend to be as segregated as anything else. Um, and But that presents an opportunity. If you're working in a faith-based context, the opportunity to bring people together um, it can be as simple as a black church and a white church coming together to work together. Um, it can be bringing majority white and majority black denominations together. Um, we have for years had on our board of directors at the Center for Reconciliation a prominent uh, black clergy member um, in uh, this state. And it's it's a tremendous opportunity, I think, to try doing that because, you know, when you talk about communities, when you talk about schools, other institutions, it can be so hard to bridge those divides. Would, yes. uh, I, I agree with you 100%, um, James. When um, I was teaching, and even when I went to school, especially in Newport, the Newport public schools were so integrated, and students worked and played together, and, and, and after school were together until they had to come home or until they came home to their segregated neighborhoods. That's not happening as much as it used to, but I do see the communication of students in public schools in, in integrating together with many of the facets of what occurs in school and the work that they do in their schools. I've seen that specifically in the last 10 years. I've also been very pleased and very proud to see that there are black and white churches working together. EFC um, and Community Baptist Church, um, um, Cross Point, they, they have they have moved themselves into an environment that people are beginning to understand themselves. Yes, our religions are different, but we all serve the same God. And, and, and it's very visible to me. I don't know what it is to other people, but to me, I do see that. So I see it happening. I see it occurring. And you know what? It's going to take a while. But our future is going to be the one that changes that. Our future children. Because they are they are celebrating it now, they are experiencing them, and they're going to bring it into the future. I might not see it, but it's going to be there. And I tell people and that one day there's going to be a time where we're not going to have to worry about white and black people. We're going to have to think just about people of all one color. They're all going to be tan. <laughs> Charles? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate. I work with Roger Williams University, and I work with the students there sophomores, uh, students that want to know about history, American history. And of course, in order to know it, they want to know about Black history. And they volunteer their services and time to do research and investigation for us. And it's spreading to now URI University, because the younger generation that I've experienced doesn't think like the older generation at all, because uh, racism uh, in the extremes where there are dogs and separation like that doesn't occur in their lives because they're all kind of, as far as music goes they and entertainment, they enjoy the same things together. So they, they enjoy the same fads. They work together. They all are on computers and they all uh, listen to TikTok. So, so uh, I think that the next generation or the generation that is here now is the dead already the future? Let me ask a question that throws a, a little bit of a monkey wrench into that, I guess. And that's the question of class. Because it is still the case that um, our communities are as much are divided by class 
and they're divided by race. And those two things are not the same, but they intersect in interesting ways. So at, at the risk of sounding like, I don't know, a communist or something, let me ask, um, uh, how, how do we deal with that relationship between race and class? Well, you know, uh, uh, at a certain point through education and experiencing other peoples uh, that you're being educated with, that class distinction changes. I mean, I know I have young people I work with are very from very affluent families, but they still get together with this other students that are black and, and Asian, and they want to know and understand the same history in classrooms. So I think that that class distinction, which is also economics, because a, a young person oh, in the in a, inner city doesn't get a chance to experience uh, college in the same approach as persons with a lot of money. So, but, but because they're working together and on the same subject matter, those class distinctions start to dissipate. I agree with you, Charles. It is starting to dissipate. Um, I went to a, a school last year with um, a very good, wealthy amount of parents and, and their children. And I had a gentleman from our group who must be about 90 years old. And he talked to those students. And you could see the intent on their faces. He talked to them about African Americans in the city of Newport, all the way from the 17th century, just taking one personality at the time. And the questions that they asked later were, pertinent to how they should be with themselves now with different people of color. And also in their classroom, there were several African-American students with them. Um, and they were, and they were all, they were all together. You could see their eyes lighting up. You could see their interest and, and the concern that they had for each other. So yes, you're right. But I think it depends on the wealthy and what schools they do send their children to. Well, I'm working with Rocky Hills. I'm working with Rocky oh, Hills. Hill right definitely now. Very, very. And it's a very affluent very school, but it's also a very mixed school. And I'm working with eighth graders that I worked with when they were fourth graders. Those eighth graders sent me a video because they're very affluent. These are mixed people but from affluent parents, black and white. And they asked to put up the medallion themselves. And they're so uh, advanced and so serious about it as eighth graders who learned when they were fourth in fourth grade that they are asking to do their own medallion ceremony with my help. They're doing it for their school and for the outside community that comes to visit them. Imagine this. A, uh, a bunch of eighth graders telling the story of black and indigenous people at their school who fought at the Battle of Rhode Island. Okay, um, so I think, um, correct me, Leah, if I'm wrong. Okay, last question coming up, and then um, uh, then we will conclude this event. Um, the last question is, how might we contact the speakers to support their work. How can we, let's start with, I'll, I'll go, uh, what do you call it, around, uh, James, how, how to contact the Center for Reconciliation. CFRRI.org, Center for Reconciliation, Rhode Island.org, CFRRI.org. Okay, Mrs. Johnson? Yes, Newport Middle Passage, um, dot com. Okay, Charles. Uh, you can contact Risham R Rhode Island Slave History Medallions dot org Risham, and uh, there's donating buttons, and you'll be able to see all of the information that I've talked to you about in one minute videos that explain how we're uh, teaching the public to be aware of uh, the culture of the other people of color. 
Well, that's great. Well, I want to thank all of the speakers uh, tonight um, and also our co-sponsors, the URI College of Arts and Sciences, the URI Department of History. Um, I am hoping that you will consider attending the final event in this series at 7 p.m. on April 14th, which is um, Annette Gordon-Reed. Some of you are familiar with her work on, um, she, she was the person who brought out the fact that Thomas Jefferson uh, had children with his enslaved um, female slave. Uh, she's, she's great. I know her quite well. She's a wonderful historian. Um, so April 14th, 7 p.m., she won a Pulitzer Prize. She will be uh, speaking at URI about her best-selling book, or a newer book, on Juneteenth. So I'm done. <laughs>